Hello, my name is Molly O'Hagan Hardy, and I'm the Digital Humanities Curator here at the American Antiquarian Society. Today I'm going to walk us through extracting MARC records from the AES General Catalog, <clears throat> importing them into a tool called MARC Edit, and then exporting them from MARC Edit into a spreadsheet or a CSV file. Three things we need to think about before we get started. One is you want to have a folder set up on your computer for the work we're going to do. It's really important that um, you know where the work's going uh, and you know how to get it easily. Um, it's easy to sort of get confused with the different documents here. So you want to have a folder set aside. Um, two, um, and perhaps most importantly, is you want to think about what you're going to be doing with this data. Um, so, um, you know, whether you're going to be mapping it, whether you're going to be using it in an exhibition, uh, whether, um, you know, you just need it in a spreadsheet format. So that will help us to determine what you're going to do with it will help you determine what data you need to get out of the catalog. Um, and, and I'll be modeling one example today, um, but you really just need to think through sort of what you're going to be uh, doing with your data. Um, and then the third thing is to download um, this tool called Mark Edit, and um, you can find it right here. Uh, as, you, as you can see, it's available both in Mac and Windows. Um, it doesn't take up a lot of space. The, minute, the download takes uh, really less than a minute, I think. Um, but a couple caveats about Mark Edit. Um, it is a free um, a freeware um, tool, and so uh, it, it can be a little clunky. Um, uh, I've had it crash on me before um, and you know you just restart it and, and keep going um, also the aesthetic of it is it's very uh, stripped down and simple um, in terms of the way it looks um, and so just to be prepared that you're not um, you're not working with a big flashy uh, form of software um, but you'll see that once we get into it so you want to go ahead and download mark edit before we begin if you're following along Okay, the next thing I want to show you is the AAS General Catalog. If you go into the catalog um, and you go into any one of our search screens, you'll notice that um, there's a help button uh, at the top and um, that uh, right here uh, on any one of the search screens you can get to the help button and if you go there you'll see that we have an extensive documentation that helps you to optimize your searches. I'm not going to spend time today talking much about optimizing searches uh, because all that information is here for you to look at um, uh, in your leisure time, um, but uh, but it is all here. What we're doing today, besides um, exporting searches, is here, which is one thing we're going to start with today. But then, of course, the mark edit is not part of our catalog, so that's not in here. Um, and that's why I wanted to create this video for you. Okay, the next thing we want to do is look at our browser. So I'm using Chrome, it doesn't matter which one you use, but the key here is that you go into the preferences of your browser. And what you're looking for is the part about downloads, right? You need to tell your browser how to deal with downloads, right? So um, as you can see, I've clicked here, ask where to save each file before downloading. These are different on your browser, but um, you should be able to tell it to make sure to check with you before it downloads any file you've asked it to download. Okay, so now I think we're just about ready to get started. So we're going to go back to the AAS catalog and we're going to do a keyword search. For today's purposes, my question is, what um, books of Phyllis Wheatley's poems were published in the colonies and the early United States uh, between 1770 and 1820? Now let me say a little bit about that date range. 1770 I've chosen because I know that that's when the first uh, Phyllis Wheatley was published, the first Phyllis Wheatley book was published in Boston. 1820 I've chosen because of something called the NAEP catalog, the North American Imprints Program. And this is something I've written about extensively on the blog. This is one um, blog post that sort of introduces and explains it that you might want to take a moment um, to look at. Um, but basically what NAEP is, it functions as a union catalog for everything printed in what would become the United States uh, between 1639 and 1820, right? We, c we claim comprehension up to 1800, fairly comprehensive up to 1820. We're working on the 30s and 40s, right? So the idea here, this idea of a union catalog, is that um, that the the things that are in NAEP, it doesn't mean that the AES has them, right? It just means that they were printed and therefore we want a record of them in our catalog so that you can do the kind of work that we're going to do today. Okay, so let me show you what that means practically. Okay, so as I said, we're going to be looking at um, Phyllis Wheatley, right? So I'm going to put her in as the author. 
And then because, again, when I'm in, in searching, I'm looking at both what the AS has and at the NAEP collection. So it's possible that a book of Phyllis Wheatley's that was printed in London, the AS might have a, a copy of, right? But I don't want that, right? That's not my research question about her, um, her publication in London, right? So I want to say not London, right? And I also want to say not in a broadside format. I know, for example, that Phyllis Wheatley's uh, poems were sometimes printed on broadsides. And I don't want to include those. I just want to know when Phyllis Wheatley's books were published, right? Um, so again, there's a lot of sort of research and thinking that goes into these um, extractions before we even get to this point. And then, as I said, 1770 to 1820. Um, and, um, and again, I want to know all locations, right? I, I'm not at the AS wanting to look at these books at this point. Instead, I'm asking this question about what uh, what and where was Phyllis Wheatley published before 1820. Okay, so now I'm going to go ahead and do my search, right? And I get eight results, which seems about right, okay? And if I look, again, you'll see that this first one, right, this looks like that first Boston edition, um, is here at AES. You'll see that this one is not, but again, we include it because um, it, was, it was a book that was published in what would become the United States, um, uh, in this period, right? Um, and a couple things to note about this record that'll become important in a minute. Um, one is that uh, you'll see these brackets here, and that simply means that we know that the publication place was Rhode Island, and that's usually where it appears in a mark record, but it doesn't on this title page, right? This is a transcription of the title page, and so it's in brackets. So you can trust anything in brackets. Um, you'll notice in contrast, this 1770, also in brackets, which means it didn't appear on the title page in this place, right, which is where dates usually appear. That's why it's in brackets, but it's also got a question mark after it to say we th we're pretty sure that this was published in 1770. We're sure enough to put the 1770 date, but we can't say for certain, so we're going to include a question mark. Okay, but let's go back to our search results, right? And I'm going to select all of the results, and I want to um, export them, right? Okay, great. So now I'm at this screen, and I want to export them as a mark, uh, a raw mark, mark eight, you want to choose there. And I'm going to go ahead and click export. This is where the work that we did previously to check on our browser becomes so important, right? Because it pops up and asks me this question. Okay, so I'm just going to call this PW and practice. And notice, this is the most important thing here that um, we want to change this to MRC, right? Uh, MarkEdit doesn't know what to do with a DO file, right? Um, and so we don't, um, we want to make sure that we change the, the ending there to, um, to, DRC, to MRC from DO. Then uh, I'm going to go in and I know that I set up a Wheatley practice folder, right? And so I'm going to save it there, right? And Chrome um, asked me, are you sure you meant to change it from DO to MRC? And I'm saying, yes, I know for sure that I did. Okay, so now that file is there. Now I'm going to go ahead and open my Mark Edit, right? And it might look a little bit different on Windows, but it has the same functionality. And I go up to Tools, and I tell it that I want to export tab delimited records. Okay, so I'm exporting tab delimited records from my tools. And the first thing I do is just tell, I need to tell it what I'm importing and where I want to export. So I'm importing the file I just created, right? So I go here and I say, where's my Wheatley practice? Well, it's right here, and there it is. One thing to note here is that sometimes the file type defaults to MRK, and you just want to make sure that you go to MRC, because otherwise it won't see the file you just created. Okay, so I tell that, please pull this file in, and then where do I want it to export, right? And what do I want exported? Um, well, as I talked about, right, so we'll just call it PW practice because it is the same data, right? It's just going into a different format. Notice that the default here is TXT, right? But instead, I want to change to a CSV, right? I want that spreadsheet format, right? And oh, look, it's already on Wheatley practice, so it's going to go to the right folder. Okay, great. So I'm going to go ahead and save that. So I've just set my file path. Don't worry about these delimiters. And then we'll just go to next, right? And this is probably the trickiest part because this is where we have to get into the mark and decide which field we want to be columns. Okay, so let's go back to an AAS record, right? Oh, sorry. If we go um, to our AAS records, and I can click on any one of these. Let's go back to the Rhode Island one. Rhode Island 
addition, right? And in any AAS record, there's this staff view option, right? And when you click that, what you see is the mark record behind the record that appears in your initial search result, right? Um, this isn't all of the mark records that we use, but it's a good portion of them, and it should be all that you need um, for your purposes. Um, okay, so what is all this, right? So these numbers are, um, are, are designated fields where certain kinds of information go. Um, if you just Google um, uh, mark tagging, you'll find a number of resources online. This is the one that I choose to use um, that helps me to understand what the different fields mean, right? I just find this Penn State uh, uh, version um, really just straightforward and, and, and easy to follow. But I can also just look, so some combination of looking there and looking in the record to help me to figure out what it is I need to pull into my spreadsheet. Okay, now one thing I want to say is that all records have this number that we call um, a bib ID or a record ID and I always recommend that you pull the 001 field so that this number comes into your spreadsheet. You won't do anything with that that number um, in terms of um, graphing it or anything like that but the thing that's really important about it is that if you ever need to find this exact item in our catalog, that number is the easiest way to do it. You can put that number into a keyword search and you get this item um, exactly, this record exactly. Um, so I always recommend keeping it with the item. So we know we're going to want the 001 field. We know we don't need the 100 field, which is the author, because we know that this is the, you know, these are books by Phyllis Wheatley. That's the nature of this search. But in another scenario, uh, you might need the author field, right? The 245, this is a transcribe field, right? So this is what it says on the, on the title page. And the 245A is sort of like the main title, right? And it can still be kind of long, especially when we're in the 18th century, right? Um, but I do want to get the 245A so I know the title. Um, the 260, also a transcribe field, and this is publication information. Um, uh, the 260, this, some of this information appears in other fields um, in a standardized way. For our purposes here today, we're just going to grab it in the 260 field. Notice that it's got these subfields, A, B, and C, and I want to make sure to distinguish those when I'm in MarkEdit because that means that each one will get its own column in my spreadsheet, and you'll see what I'm talking about in just a minute. The 650 and the 655, the 650 is the subject heading and the 655 is the genre heading. For AES records and NAEP records in particular, uh, we do a fabulous job of including this information. It's based on the, um, the uh, authority, record, uh, authority name, uh, authorities set out by the Library of Congress, um, so it's always consistent. Um, and you may have heard some digital humanists talking about, uh, you know, when they're working with like Hathi Trust data, how the bibliographic metadata, especially around genre, can be really confusing. But when you're in our catalog, you're not going to have those problems for the most part because, um, as I say, our, our, um, ours is so standardized, right? Okay. Uh, and so consistently used is really the main point. Okay, so I think I know which fields I'm going to grab now. So I'm going to go back to MarkEdit, and oftentimes I'll be in MarkEdit and checking back um, at, the, um, at the record just to make sure I'm getting them along. Um, but what I can do, I want to make sure that I normalize my field data. That just helps to get rid of some of the additional um, punctuation and signage that, um, that Mark uses that we don't need for our purposes. So I want to normalize my field data, and then I just start entering the fields that I want. I want the 001, that's that um, bib or record ID. I want the 245, and I want the 245A. It's super important that I add that subfield. I'm going to add that field, and then I want the 260A, add the field, the 260B, I'm going to add that field, and the 260C, so I have now my imprint information, and then as we talked about, I'm going to grab the 650 and the 655. Now you'll realize that there are two 650s, right? Um, but there's no subfield, so there's no nothing for me to put in there, and I'll show you um, why that matters when we get to the spreadsheet. Um, and then I'm going to do the 655 as well. Okay, and I can go in and just check, make sure everything's there, right? Make sure I included the subfields, right? And um, the order here doesn't really matter. Um, it'll it will dictate the order that your columns appear in your spreadsheet. Um, 
the other thing I just want to point out is that the settings can be really useful because you can save um, this set of fields, um, save the settings, and then um, and then that way you don't have to type it in every time if you know you always want to extract the same information from the from the records. Okay, great. So I am all set. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and export, right? And it happens that fast. It, it just happens really quickly. And then I'm going to go and say, okay, thank you. And I'm going to go and look at that folder that I created, right, where I had asked this to go. So here's my Wheatley Practice folder, right? And here it is in a CSV. Great. So here are my eight records in a CSV. A couple things I just want to note quickly here. Um, is that the title's long, right? That's the full title. You'll notice the 260, right? The A, B, and C all got separated out. Now, with the 650s and the 655s, they didn't get separated out because they didn't have subfields. So I'd need to go and do some data cleaning. Um, I'm not going to get into data cleaning today, but you can do a lot of an Excel or you can use um, Google Refine. Uh, if that's uh, something you're more used to. But here I would just use this text to columns to break up these different subject and genre headings. Um, okay, well, thank you so much for, for listening along here. And if this raises questions for you, please don't hesitate to be in touch. Uh, my name again is Molly O'Hagan Hardy, and I'm the Digital Humanities Curator at the American Antiquarian Society. Okay, have fun with Mark Edit. Bye.